John Corral, who is coming to bring the word tonight. So let's make sure that we have remove all distractions and let the word of God do its job on our hearts. Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Glad that we can gather together to hear the word of God. I am just praying that the Lord uses what is said to do some work in hearts, because it's not of me, and I can't do this under my own power, so depending on God tonight to give you something that you can use. When booking an airline ticket online, there are several steps that one has to go through before the ticket is theirs. First, you must find the ticket that best suits your travel needs and aligns with the time that you want to travel. Next, you must fill out all the passenger information you and your travel party need. Third, you need to click past all of those annoying offers to add a hotel, rental car, or upgrades that you do not need. Fourth, you need to decline the insurance. No one needs the insurance most of the time, so you decline that insurance. But lastly, you get to the page to enter your payment information. You reach deep into your purse or wallet and pull out the plastic. You carefully enter the exact digits of the card into the system. You're cautious while entering your billing information. You then click review. After your travel information is now back on the screen for one final check, you meticulously scan the page looking for errors while verifying that you picked the right flight information before hitting that final submit. Once you are confident that everything is what it should be, you hit that final submit button. As you patiently wait for that spinning wheel to stop to show you the fruits of your completing this challenging task, your face lights up as that glorious confirmation screen appears. Nothing is more gratifying than seeing that confirmation code signaling that you are ready to go and that seat aboard that aircraft has been locked in and set aside only for you. Tonight I want to preach a, what I think is a simple message on confirmation. Confirmation. What a sense of joy and happiness that confirmation can bring. Whether it is confirmation for a major purchase, such as an airplane ticket like I just described, or a child confirming that you hear, that they hear you and are doing what they are asked to do. Confirmation is important. But more importantly than just the confirmation of a job well done, is who is doing the confirming. When we get verification of our actions or future actions from our peers or even our pastor, that is a good thing. We all enjoy the fact of knowing that our plan or directions has been validated by someone we know and trust. But can I say that the validation does not, that validation does not hold a candle to when God confirms our plans, actions, future, or directions that we want to take. This year at Cornerstone, we have adopted the theme of praying without ceasing. As a church, we have made this our endeavor in 2022. I am sure that many of you has also included prayers for direction and God's leading in your life. And you're patiently waiting for God to stand by and answer those, those prayers. God knows us all and all that we want to do and will do. He orchestrates our steps as we see in Psalms 37, 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighted in his way. This tells us that the, that the best way to gain God's approval 
is by walking in his paths and aligning our plans to his will. We will see later on how following God's plan will, allow, will always lead to God's approval and confirmation in our lives. Tonight I want to take a deeper look at confirmation. Each of us may be thinking, okay, confirmation, what does that mean? Glad you asked. Looked at dictionary.com and I saw five different meanings for the word confirmation. They all stem from the root word, which means to confirm or to confirm. So here are the five examples that I found. First one is to establish the truth, accuracy, validity, or genuineness of, corroborate, or verify. The second, to acknowledge with definite assurance. Third, to make valid or binding some formal or legal act sanction. Fourth, to make firm or more firm, add strength to, or settle or establish firmly. Five, to strengthen a person in habit, resolution, opinion, etc. Confirmation helps us to feel at ease and that the decision that we have made or path that we have chosen, chosen to take is the best one for us at that moment. So we all need confirmation of some sort on what we're doing or choosing to do in our lives. Throughout our lives, confirmation is, will be wanted, sought after, and achieved for many of the choices that we choose to make. Tonight I want to take a look at a man that sought God's confirmation on his life before acting and making the next moves in his situation. But before we dive into our story tonight, let's pause and ask God to bless the message. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you that you've given us your word, and Lord, that we can learn great things from your word. And Lord, you've given us many examples, many characters, many situations that, Lord, they, they glean many lessons, Lord, and it's just up for us, the readers and hearers, Lord, to take away that which you've given us from it. Lord, it's not only to hear a, a, a count or a story, but to take it with us, to act on it, to not make the same mistakes that many have made in the past, oh God. But Lord, your word leads our path. So Lord, I ask that you take away all distractions right now. You call my heart, Lord, you speak through me, Lord, to give those here something that you would want us to take away from this lesson. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you just speak to our hearts, Lord, and Lord, use us as you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll take a look at the first definition that of the word confirmation, which means to acknowledge with definite assurance. And to help us with this lesson, we'll be in our Bibles. You can turn to Judges 6. Judges 6 in our Bibles tonight. We'll be taking a look at a man that many of us may have heard the story, but we'll look at his life and how the need for confirmation affected many of his actions. So Judges 6, we start at verse 14 and make our way through the passage. That'll be our text verse for tonight, so you may want to leave something there as we turn to, to different passages along the way. Judges 6, starting with verse 14, and then we'll make our way through the chapter. So starting at verse 14, we read, and the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? So for most of us that know this story, that man is none other than Gideon. God had called Gideon to do the work of saving his people, Israel. But before we get to Gideon's choices, let me paint the picture of where Israel was at this time. The children of Israel had once again done evil in the sight of the Lord. For most of us that know our Bible, know there was an on and off, on again, off again uh, relationship between Israel and the Lord. When things were going good, 
the people of Israel knew the Lord. When things wasn't going that well, they didn't know who God was. So, at this point, they had started following the people of the land, and they were doing evil once again in God's sight. So God allowed them to be captured by the Midianites for seven years. God's people were enslaved to not only the Midianites, but also to the um, Melekites that came out of the east. They came and they took over everything. Israel was an impoverished nation because of these invaders. The passage said that they outnumbered Israel completely. They came and destroyed the whole shebang. They took everything from Israel. So imagine the Lord providing all that you need, and then these people come out of nowhere and take it all from you. And now we see Israel is in a bad way. So what does Israel always do? When they're down on their luck, who did they turn to? God. Israel only knew God when they were in need. So Israel to me paints a perfect picture of how many of us act. Things are good, we all start to do our own thing. Sometimes we forget about God in some areas and we deviate from God's plan. We all end up doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Then when we realize that we are in way over our heads, guess who we turn to? God. It's only when we need that relief, that's when we know God again. That is when we remember that we have access to the God of heaven, who sits high and looks low and knows all. And just like he did back then, when Israel ran back to him, God had to remind them who he was. It was as if Israel forgot all the good things that God had done for them. This is a time when Israel had, was just delivered from bondage in Egypt. They had just gotten into the promised land not too long ago, and God was making enemies fall to their feet one after the next. But yet still, it didn't stop Israel from getting away from God. So, God had to remind them. God sent his man. He sent a prophet to let them know, I am the one that brought you out of Egypt. I am the one that got you out of bondage. I delivered you from the enemies and set you in the promised land. And all the oppressors, they fell at your feet because of who? Me, God. Because I, I am he that did these things. But did the people listen? No, not at all. They did not hearken unto the voice of God, the passage says. So with all this oppression going on, it was probably hard for the people of Israel to know that God was still with them. In fact, God had to send an angel to Gideon himself to deliver this news. So we'll go up a couple of verses to verse number 12 and read when God interacts with Gideon for the first time. The verse says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, the mighty man of valor. Imagine, the Lord sent an angel to find Gideon. Gideon should have been ecstatic, happy, joyous. But was he? The Lord delivered a, a shocking endorsement that he was with them. He will be with him. But instead of being ecstatic, Gideon was the exact opposite. The next verse shows us, verse number 13. Reads, and Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of saying? Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? Bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord had forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Wow. What a thing to say to the angel of the Lord. Gideon came off though right bitter, didn't he? Gideon questioned God openly and to his face. 
He questioned him and he acted, he acted as if it was God's fault that the people were in this mess. Somehow he tried to attribute that to God. He forgot about all the wickedness of his people and he decided to throw himself his own little pity party. I can hear Gideon right now saying, if the Lord is with us, why are these things so bad happening to us right now? Does that sound familiar to anyone? Things just seem not to go away just a little bit. But God, I'm doing the best I can. Where are you? Right there with you. But God, why me? Oh, why me? But look at them and oh, why me? Have you ever thought to yourself, if God takes care of his children, then why am I going through this struggle right now? Maybe, just maybe, God is saying to you, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Sometimes God has to take us through a little bit of pain just to show you that he loves us. He never promised us a better road, is it? But he always promised that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Or maybe, just maybe, he may be taking you through something to try to increase your faith and dependence upon him. Sometimes we get too far ahead of ourselves and we believe it's something that we have done, but not that he has done, why we are where we are today. That's where God steps in and reminds us of, like he did before, who he is and how much we need him in our lives. God is a God of mercy and justice. It is his character to, it is in his character to give a righteous punishment to his people for their indiscretions. As we continue to see that not only did Gideon question God, and what he can do, but he also accuses God of leaving his people and letting them fall into the hands of the enemy. Somehow he said that this was God's fault. No doing of the people themselves. But my question to you, and also as I question Gideon, who do you think you are? Who was Gideon to question God? So, Let's flip that around to myself. Who am I when I question God? Who are you when we question God for where we are or what he is doing in our lives? God knows all and sees all. And he knows what's best for each and every one of us. So where do we get off questioning any of his action? We can never point a finger at God because there should be at least four coming right back at us. But folks, can I even look at the flip side of Gideon's um, predicament? The people were enslaved. Yes, slavery is not great. Not saying it was the best situation for Israel. The people were poor. Obviously, the Midianites and the Amalekites took all that they have, the sheep, the cattle, the land, and gave them the, the lowest of the low. But can we look at the bright side? You may think the bright side. Yeah, there has to be a bright side. Even at Israel's lowest point, they still had something to be thankful for. Once again, looking back at the time that this was, Gideon didn't realize how much God was with them. So we recall that God had just taken the people of Israel out of Egypt, carried them across the wilderness, brought them to the promised land, and told them, that land that is flowing with milk and honey, I have given to you. Who else inhabited the, the promised land at that time? All kinds of nations. Israel didn't have it easy claiming the promised land. And what was God's directive to them? Go into the promised land and wipe out all these nations. Take the promised land. He didn't want them to keep anyone back. He didn't ask them to enslave half of these countries and these people. He asked the people of Israel to go in and clean house. God was judging those people at that time through Israel. 
So if you think of the flip side, know that Israel is in bondage. The God could have allowed the Amalekites and the Midianites to completely wipe out Israel. Didn't they just do the same thing to many countries? They wiped out countries from the bottom up. And God could have just allowed them, wipe them all out. Let's start over. But instead, God allowed the people to be enslaved. Yes, not great, but you do have life. Amen? So they did have life, they did have strength, and most importantly, they did have God. So there was a shining light in, in their dark hour. God was protecting those people from being slaughtered by, from the Midianites. He allowed them just to become slaves and not to be completely wiped off the earth. But Gideon couldn't see that at the time. Gideon decided, where were you, God? You left us. You allowed this to happen. Where were all these miracles our, our fathers told us about? Why, why, why? Continued to show his party. So now let's move on to God now giving Gideon the confirmation, the acknowledgement, and the assurance that he needed that he will help lead the people out of this predicament. So now we go back to verse 14 where we started off. And we read that the Lord told Gideon that he would be the one to save his people. Verse 14. And the Lord looked upon him straight at Gideon, and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Once again, Gideon could have been jubilant. God wanted to use him to free his people. Gideon could have taken this confirmation from God and just gone wild. He could have taken it, and he could have been so glad that he was chosen by God to do what he thought was impossible. But you know what he did instead? He actually took a road that many of us may take at a point in this. But, but, but me, God, what, me, I'm not. He started to make excuses. So we look at verse 15. And he said, talking about Gideon, unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Gideon began to give all kinds of excuses. And if you look at excuses, he kind of don't hold water because they have nothing to do with nothing. Gideon said, my family is poor in Manasseh. Can I say at that point, everybody were poor in Manasseh if you were the children of Israel? They literally like took everything you had. All of Israel were poor. It's kind of just a blank, empty excuse Gideon found to give. Then, when he thought he needed more, well, I am the least in my father's house. Go find somebody else in the house. Anything but to do the will of God. Sometimes we get off making excuses for not doing the work of God. Whenever God points to us and says, this is what I want you to do, what is your next reaction? Is it to say, but me? Or not today? Or maybe next time because I have to. What are some of the excuses that we give God? Think about it for a minute. God has to talk to you at some point. And when he asks you to do something, what's your immediate reaction? Do you point at the fact that you're poor? You may not be all that you can be or the greatest person in your house. But God calls you. He expects you to do something, does he not? Even though Gideon gave God some of the worst excuses you can see, God doubled down and gave Gideon the greatest gift that anybody asked of God can receive. We look simply to Judges 16. And we see God giving Gideon that gift. Judges 6, 16. And it says, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. 
What else can God give you but his companionship that means anything else to you at, at a dark time? God said, I will be with you. That's like having the biggest big brother ever with you by your side. God didn't say that Gideon has to go and beat them by himself. He said, I will be right there with you. And you will, and he said, and you will smite the Midianites as one man. He means, I will do this through you. It'll, it'll be like you're doing it, but I'm right there. God told Gideon, you don't have to do it by yourself. So can I ask you a question tonight? If God was to verbally tell you that he would be with you through all the tough times, what would your answer be to him? God whispers in your ear, I'll be with you. What is your answer? One, one person's answer we can see, Gideon, we see what his answer was. God told him, I'll be with you. And in verse 17, Gideon asked for a sign. I found this very interesting because most of us know Gideon for the major signs that he asked for a little bit later down the road. But when God initially came to Gideon, Gideon already showed his character. Gideon never took God for his word. Gideon said, God, you'll be with me. But show me a sign real quick. Let's look at verse 17. And he said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight. Keep in mind the angel is with Gideon. So he's talking to the angel who's standing in for God. Then show me a sign that thou is talkest with me. So let's break this down in our vernacular. Gideon is talking to this angel to his face and said, you talking to me? But give me a sign. Gideon, I'm talking to you. But give me a sign. Gideon is doing nothing else but trying to get a way out of this. So, Gideon asked for a sign. He said, Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And the angel said, and he said, I will tarry until thou come again. Even though this sign was a small sign, it showed where Gideon's mind was at from the beginning. Gideon was never going to just take what God told him. Gideon needed it proof to him. He needed that confirmation. So, when faced with that, God told you he'll be with you. He's waiting on an answer. What would your response be? Will you be like Gideon and say, well, God, well, show me something. Show. When God is directly talking to you, do you need God to tell you a different way? Send somebody else after you? Tell you in a different sign like Gideon did? Gideon wanted a sign just to know that God was talking to him. Even though God was talking to him point blank through his angel. Christians, don't let this be said about you tonight that you are ever a doubter. Don't be a doubter of God. He didn't have a simple lesson. Trust God. But instead, he questioned God. He asked God to prove it to him. So, let's get to down a little bit. Let's skip down to verse 33. Judges 33. So now this is the part of the story that many of us are more familiar with. I'm going to speed us up in where we're at. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east gathered together against Israel once again. But at this time now, Gideon at least knew that God wanted to do something with him. So the Spirit of the Lord came over Gideon. And he remembered what God had told him some time back. If you remember verse 13, God already told him exactly what he wanted him to do. He said, I will use you to save Israel, and I will be with you, right? But Gideon already showed his colors. Gideon already knew exactly how he was going to respond to God. So he said that the Spirit of the Lord came over him. He remembered God's words. 
that he would save the children of Israel by Gideon's hand? You would think that just remembering this fact, this confirmation God gave him so long ago, the first sign that God had to prove to him, all of that, Gideon would say, you know what? God's for real. God's going to be there. God's going to help. But we all know that Gideon needed more assurance. Like I said before, Gideon already showed his colors. He needed, even though God selected him to be the man for the job, he needed that definite assurance that God wanted him for this job. So we read verse 36 and 37. We're in Judges 6, 36 and 37. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand. As thou hast said. Whew. Gideon. Gideon stated that God had already, had already said that he would be the man. And that should have been enough. He, he stated it in the verse. If thou wilt save Israel by my hand. He knew that's what God already told him to do. But, trying to get out of it again. If I am the man. This is how you can prove it to me, God. Gideon needed a miracle to firmly establish God's claim. So how about it? When God gives us a test, do we ask God to confirm? Do we ask God to prove himself to us? Do we ask God to please God, make sure, be 100% right, God. I need you to prove this to me or else. That's what Gideon told God. Gideon wanted to put God through every test. So, you may be praying for God's leading tonight or asking him to show you his will for your life. But when he shows you what he wants, you then need a miraculous sign just to make sure that you heard him right. When God answers your prayers, he doesn't need you to double guess it, triple guess it, or double check. Why pray if you're not going to accept the answer? Why act if you're not ready for what comes back? Every time the Lord speaks in your life, does he need to verify his wants to you before you would consider, even consider doing it? What happened to just trusting God tonight? Just leaning on his word? And letting him take care of the rest. Sometimes that's all we can do. Sometimes that's all we should do. We shouldn't try to make it happen. We shouldn't try to verify that I heard him right. We should just say, you know what, God? I think that's what you're asking me to do, so I'm going to do it. Gideon showed us what not to do. But you know what? We have a loving God. When I was reading this, I was quite surprised that God didn't strike him down the first time. I was like, wow, that was kind of bold. Like, you literally said, like, first you, you made excuses, then you asked him to prove it. Like, I could have said, like, all right, I'm done with this. I'm God. Next person, you know. But God shows that he has patience with us. That's all I could get from that. God gives patience to each and every one of us. Because without this, a lot of us wouldn't be here. It has many instances in the Bible where God decided, I'm done with this. And then he opens up the ground and 3,000 people are swallowed up. Or he shows some people that, you know what, I'm going to give you two, three, four, 18 chances, and then I'm going to help you out. I'm going to bring you along. God is a God of mercy. That's all I could get from that. God could have easily, I mean, real easy, struck Gideon down and move on to somebody else. So consider your reaction to God's wants. That's a question I want to pose tonight. How do you react when God asks you to do something? Are we past the days of just stepping out in faith? And have we quickly replaced stepping out in faith with, well, I just need to be sure. Uh, I don't know if 
that one really was for me. He probably like answered the person behind me, saying, I dodge my way out that prayer. We just need to trust what God is saying to us and do that. We need to get back to letting God be God. So, let's read verse 38 and 39. And it was so, meaning God did it. Gideon asked, God did it. Not really sure why God decided that he was going to go along with this, but he's God. So, for he rose up early on the morrow, meaning Gideon, and he thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. That's going to be important. And Gideon said unto God, let not anger be hot against me. So, if you think about it, Gideon is saying, he's kind of trying to prep God. Gideon is like, God, I can't see what you did there. You did what I kind of asked you to do, but I ain't really sure if you meant that one for me. It kind of could have been anybody, please, but you happened to catch me. So, I need you to do one more thing for me, just to make sure that you, re you really mean me, right? So Gideon said, let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove. I pray thee, but this once with the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. For it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Once again, God showing his mercy. God could have easily said, I did this. Already, we went there, got it covered. God said, I'll do it. Because I'm God. I can. I love you. I'm going to be patient with you this time. I'm going to bring you along. I'm not going to end it. God showed his merciful hand. God wants to show us all mercy. But we don't have to make him work for it. Sometimes... All we do is say, God, if this is what you want, and when we have that clear understanding, we should just say, God, I'm going to do it. Not only did God have to validate his claim, but then he had to reconfirm it as well when Gideon asked him to do the same thing, but in reverse. We can all learn a few things from Gideon's confirmation test tonight. Number one, when God answers prayer, you will know it. God will do the impossible to prove to you how serious he is about his work. No need to try to explain away God's providential work, because in the end, you will see that it could only be done by God. God doesn't deal in the, oh, well, I can't do it, and then maybe he'll think it's me, and he'll figure it out in the morning. God did it. He, he did exactly what he wanted, and he showed him. It only, it's only me who could have done that. God is serious. So, when God talks to us seriously, we need to answer him seriously back. And not play games with God. Two, when God answers prayer, he does it above and beyond what you can ask or think. In the case of Gideon, we see this by how soaked the fleece was. The Bible said that this fleece was so soaked. Remember, the, the ask was, the fleece be soaked, and nothing around it be soaked as well. So, this fleece could have just been a little bit damp, and God could have been like, ah, I did it. But God said, no, you're going to know I did it. You're not going to think somebody spit on the ground, or, or somebody passed by and sweat. God said, no, no, no. God said, this thing is going to be soaking wet. It says that he picked up the fleece, and he ringed it up, and he gave him a bowl full of water. That was God proving a point. God said, you put me to the test, I'm going to make sure you know that I did it. I don't want you to give anybody else this glory but me. Because I did it my way. I did it how I saw fit. I did it past what you wanted to prove a point. That's what God shows us. He doesn't do stuff halfway. He, he's full in all the time. God never does anything halfway. God wants to bless each and every one of us, 
but he must do it his own way. Don't try to put any kind of limitations on God or what he wants to do through you. Just give yourself over to him and let him use you, and you'll see that God can do the impossible with you. Sometimes we go out, we say, you know what, uh, I could only do so much. But if you bid that thing in prayer and you say, God, I'm doing it to your full potential, I'm doing what I can because of the situation, God will use that thing. Think about sometime you're so winning life. You go out and you say, you know what, temperatures are 20, I um, can't feel my toes, but you know what, God, I'm going to just put some tracks in the door. Then the next day, somebody comes out. You say, hey, nice to meet you. First time at corner store. Yeah, somebody put a track to my door, and I thought it was pretty cool. Don't, seeing that it was 20 degrees with a negative 5 wind chill, they must mean business. You don't know what God will do. Just once we give whatever we want to do over to God, we pray about that thing, and we say, God, you, this is what I got for you. Do what you will. God will do something uh, impossible. I'll never forget one of the biggest things I ever see God do in my life was out soul winning, not thinking that a tract would do anything. More scared to give it to the person than, than anything. I said, you know what, God, I think, I think you want me to give this to this person. And I ran back because I already passed him in fear. And I said, you know what, I want to invite you out to our church. And the person said, okay, and took it. Took two steps and came back and said, hey, where's this church? Oh, 62nd and Woodlawn. Oh, okay, well, yeah, uh, when the service is, uh, 9.30, 10.30, so on and so forth. That next day, God brought that man, and not only that man, but his spouse. And they got saved, still attending the church. Just because, you know what, I didn't even think, you know, the track was going to do anything. In my own mind, I just was like, eh, it'll make a big deal. He probably didn't come anyway. But at that moment, the Holy Spirit just pricked. He just said, give him a track. Don't let him idly pass by not knowing where he's going, heaven or hell. Give him a track. And that turned into not one, but two people actually coming still to the church this day. Look at that one right now. So, God can do anything. Just once you give it him all the power and the glory. When we are not satisfied with God's answers, we begin to doubt God. Which can lead to us being satisfied with the direction he, no, sorry, not satisfied with the direction he wants to lead us in. Often this can lead us down a path of sin. And then we will have to return back to God and ask him for his forgiveness. So we can avoid his wrath. We saw that Gideon did this. Gideon said in verse 39, Let not thine anger be hot against me. Gideon knew he was getting God angry. He's like, I'm keep testing God, I'm keep testing God. He said, God, don't, don't get mad at me, please, please. And God continued to bear with him. All the wrong we do sometimes angers God. And it's only God's mercy that stops his wrath sometimes. I'll go a step further and say only the prayers of others sometimes stop God's wrath on you. There's some people that you may not know may be praying for you that can block God's wrath on your life. We've heard stories about it many times. But God, something holds the hand of God from acting adversely on your life. Four, when tempted to question God, just stop and just trust God instead. Gideon questioned God over and over. He accused God of not even caring. What could God have done with him if he accepted God's um, confirmation from the beginning? Who knows? Israel could have been saved many, many months, years earlier. Who knows what God would have done with a Gideon that was ready to turn his life over to God? But God gave him time. Gave him time. I'm not sure how much time passed between the initial um, confrontation in verse 14 to verse 36. But that's time that Israel may not have had to spend in bondage because of a questioning Gideon. 
from the first answer, God said, I'm going to use you to save Israel. And, Gide and Gideon just gave him excuses why not to use him. Imagine if that was an immediate, yes, God, let's do this. Those people could have been saved the next day. Who knows? God could have done something miraculous the next day would have given over Gideon. Many times we try to hold back from God, whether it's our time or money. We try to reason away the thing that he has, uh, that he has clearly asked us to do, just because it doesn't line up with what we would like to do. Remember, God's plan is not your plan, and his ways are not your ways. He knows the end of a thing before you even find out the beginning. God's way is best. So, in conclusion, any you know, even though God did not have to confirm any of Gideon's requests, he did so because he's a loving and just God. And he wants his people to make their own choices to follow him. God could make all of us mindless robots. Yes, God, I'll do it. God gave us free will. Because a loving God wants you to willingly come to him than for him to force you to his throne. He will never force you to do anything, even though he so easily could. Each of us has a destiny that's already been chosen by God. It is up to us to follow his word and to stay in constant communion with him in order to know his will. So let us keep in prayer so that we can say, like the psalmist in Psalms 116.1, I love the Lord because he had heard my voice and supplications. Let's pray. God, I just so thank you for your word tonight. I thank you how this example of Gideon, Lord, can be a, a, a good example to each and every one of us, oh God. Lord, I, I see that you use them to do many things, save the people of Israel. But Lord, you, all, you also see how he questioned you. He asked you to confirm, reconfirm, Lord, to do things just to prove that you are who you said you are. Lord, let that not be said of us, Lord. Let us not need, O oh God, to reconfirm or re-question you, Lord, but just to do. Lord, I pray that your word speaks to our heart tonight. Lord, I pray that as we think about the preach word, Lord, that we can honestly say to ourselves, Lord, what you ask, we will do. Lord, I pray that this is something that you can use, Lord, to continue to speak to hearts after tonight, Lord. I just thank you for how good you've been to us. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for truth. And I pray that you be with us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you for viewing our, our live stream service tonight.